Well, Harold, thank you for that very kind and overly generous introduction. As Mark Twain once said when he was introduced with a lot of effusive praise, he said, sir, you'll go to heaven for your generosity, unless you go elsewhere for your exaggeration. <laughs> but I really appreciate it, Harold. And thank you and for the award and Tom Miller and all the staff who are here and all of you from around the country. Now, let me just say this about my longtime friend, Harold Schaitberger. It's valuable for an organization as large as yours to have a strong and experienced representative on Capitol Hill, someone who is respected and in this case beloved on both sides of the aisle, maybe more on one side than the other, but on both sides. We have an expression in Congress, especially when you're making up budgets and things like that, and we have an expression that if you're not at the table, you're probably on the menu. I can assure all of you in the International Association of Firefighters, with Harold Schaitberger here, you're always at the table. So I'm honored today to stand before the brothers and sisters of one of America's truly great unions. Uh, one of the things I've always respected and admired about the firefighters going back as long as I can remember. This is a two-fisted, never back down fighting union, my kind of union. So thank you for standing up, not just for all of the members of your international, but you stand up for all working people all across America. And I thank you for that. I'd also be remiss if I didn't start off by thanking you for everything you do to keep the American people safe and secure. When it's 3 o'clock in the morning and it's raining in the south, snowing and sleeting in the north, and storming, and the fire alarm goes off, you respond immediately. You are patriotic Americans who put your lives on the line every day to keep our families and our children safe. You have earned our gratitude and our respect. But unfortunately, not everyone is as appreciative of your sacrifice. I'm deeply concerned about the arbitrary cuts to programs that undergird the middle class in this country, everything from education to medical research, food and safety. I know that you folks are concerned about cuts to the SAFER program and the FIRE Act and the FPNS grants. I want you to know that I share those concerns also. I also want you to know that as a member of the Appropriations Committee, at least for the next two years, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that those programs are funded to the maximum extent. Now, before I go on, I'll just say Harold mentioned that I am retiring after this session of Congress. It has been 40 years, and I have appreciated and valued your support of your international and Harold and all of those for all those years that I've been here. I've been very proud of the fact that I have always stood up for organized labor. And if there's one thing I hope that my service has shown, is that you can be from a so-called right-to-work state, I call it right-to-work-for-less state, and a, really, a relatively conservative state. And you can still support organized labor. And I am proud that through my 40 years representing a right-to-work state, a fairly conservative state, I'm proud of the fact that my lifetime record is a 94% with the AFL-CIO. So it's clear to me what's happening here in Congress and across the country. There is a radical faction of the Republicans, the Tea Party people, that have declared public employees to be public enemy number one. They have the gall to attack firefighters, police officers, other public servants as 
Have you heard this word, the privileged elite? It's a brazen assault on the middle class, on workers, and especially on our right to organize and bargain collectively. I've always believed, and the history of our great nation proves it, that strong unions are the foundation of a strong middle class in America. When union membership was at its peak in this country, we all prospered together. From the richest CEO to the minimum wage worker, everyone benefited from our nation's priority, prosperity, collective bargaining rights for private and public sector workers were key to this economic success. And I know that firefighters understand the value of collective bargaining and collective action. I am proud to say that firefighters stood shoulder to shoulder with their brothers and sisters and fought against these attacks in, recently in Wisconsin and Michigan. I was proud to see my good friend Harold quoted in the Michigan press saying, quote, we'll be marching with you, we'll fight with you, we'll stand on the front line with you. And you did. Because firefighters know that when unions decline in our country, the middle class suffers. You folks truly understand the value that collective bargaining rights bring prosperity to all American workers, including, yes, even those who don't belong to unions. But unfortunately, the attacks are not just on collective bargaining. They're also targeting your pensions. They're trying to score political points by scapegoating public servants for state and local budget shortfalls, huh? Well, let me state it unequivocally. Pensions are not the cause of state's fiscal problems. Retired public servants aren't living high on the hog on the taxpayer's dime. These are malicious myths being spread by people who have two objectives, to discredit public sector unions and to dismantle the pension system. As the chair of the Health, Education, Labor, Pensions Committee, over the last two to three years, I've had a series of hearings on pensions and what's happening to pensions in this country. You know, you hear all this talk about we have this crisis, we have that crisis, we have a deficit crisis. I'll tell you the one deficit crisis we have in this country, my friends. We have a pension deficit crisis. If you look, my hearings have showed this, if you look at what people in the future are going to need to basically live on when they retire and what they have put away right now and what few pensions they might have or 401ks or IRAs or something like that, between what people need and what they have in the future is about six trillion dollars. Not billion, six trillion dollars. We have eroded the pension system in this country over the last 30 years, 40 years. We now have a system where people are supposed to put money in their 401ks. You know what the average savings for people in this country are right now? Less than $10,000. People may have, you know, they may have fifty, sixty thousand $60,000 in their 401k. How long is that going to last them when they retire? People are finding it harder and harder just to meet ends, uh, pay for the housing, pay for the kids' education, let alone put away money for retirement. So what we see happening in this country is a tearing down of a pension system that really supported the middle class in the past. And so as its decline, they look at you. They look at our public employees who still have good pensions. And you know what they want to do? They want to tear you down. They want to they go out there and say, well, you've got all these pensions. Somebody in the private sector, they don't have it. So you're living high in the hog. You're the privileged elite. So they're coming after your pensions. I have just an opposite view. If you have good, secure pensions, rather than tearing you down to where other people are, let's build them up so they have secure, good pensions also.
That's why I have proposed a new pension system for America. We're working on it right now. We hope to have it introduced, but I floated it out uh, last fall. We've been working on it. Uh, maybe some of people in the public sector might say it might not affect you all that much, but, the, but my point is, my, my goal is to get a new pension system out there, a pension, folks, not 401ks, not IRAs that you can borrow on that are going to be gone. I mean a pension that will guarantee you a monthly income for as long as you live. That's the kind of pension system we need. So I, I heard Harold say this in introducing me. That's what I'm focusing on this year and next year. I am hell-bent to get a new pension system out there for the private sector, for people that are out there that go from job to job to job to job, maybe, so that they can put money in a pension and know that it's secure, that they can know it's going to be there for them when they retire. I think that's the best way to make sure that your pensions are secure and that they don't keep coming after you to tear down your pensions. So I'm going to be fighting for this over the next couple of years. Harold knows this, and Tom, and Kevin, and all the people that work here. I'm just asking for your help and your support to make sure we can get it across the finish line, because you've always stood, as I said, you've always stood for your union, but you stand for all working people in America. And the one thing we can give working people is a new, secure pension system for the future. Now these days there's a huge disconnect in this country and this pension thing kind of has a lot to do with it. A couple of weeks ago, Wall Street was popping champagne corks. The Dow Jones Industrial Average reached an all-time high. Corporate profits are skyrocketing. The new female CEO of Yahoo, earning $100 million a year, has built a nursery next to her office for her newborn baby. Good for her. But she then canceled all work from home privileges for other members at Yahoo. Sort of our modern day Marie Antoinette. You know, let them eat cake. She makes $100 million a year. She can build a nursery. But for young women working there who need some time off to care for the newborn babies, uh uh, they can't stay at home and do that work. They got to show up. My friends, this is what's happening in America this pulling apart between those at the top and the middle class. Income inequality is worse than at any time since 1929. Union membership as a part of our total workforce is at the lowest it's been since 1916. Tens of millions of Americans struggling with life-changing profound economic hardships. The worst unemployment crisis since the Great Depression. More and more Americans losing their grip on the middle class. This is the real meaning of rising income inequality and trickle-down economics. The real meaning of trickle-down economics? Too many middle class Americans trickling down into poverty and want, losing their pensions, even as incomes at the top continue to soar. Now, meanwhile, it's the same old story here on Capitol Hill. Senators and congressmen fiercely protecting tax breaks and giveaways for the wealthiest people in this country, but hell-bent, hell-bent to slash programs serving the middle class, the elderly, people with disabilities. Again and again, my Republican friends say, quote, we have a spending problem. How many times have you heard that? We have a spending problem. We have a spending problem. They just keep saying that. And the assumption is, that we have a spending problem, we can't afford all of these things like education for our kids, pensions for our elderly, we can't afford those because there's an assumption like America's broke. Isn't that what it is? Sort of an assumption, we're broke, we can't afford this stuff. Huh. We can't afford to invest in a stronger middle class. I can't tell you how much I disagree with that conventional wisdom. The United States is the richest nation in the history of the world. We have the highest per capita income of any nation. 
Well, that kind of begs the question, doesn't it? If we're so rich, why are we so broke? If we're so rich, why are we so broke? Is it just a spending problem? Of course not, we're still rich. The real problem is we have a misallocation of capital, a misallocation of wealth in this country. Corporate profits, CEO compensation soaring, folks in the top 1% seeing a huge increase in their incomes. Meanwhile, over the last decade, the percentage of children living in poverty has gone from 16% to 22%. Think about this. In the 1970s, Harold, when I first came here, the minimum wage paid about 20% over the poverty line. Today it pays 20% under the poverty line. The minimum wage has become a poverty wage. It's a national shame. That's why last week Congressman George Miller and I introduced a bill to raise the minimum wage to $10.10 an hour by 2016. to raise it to $10.10 .10 by 2016 and index it so we don't keep falling behind all the time. Someone said, oh, $10.10, .10, it's $7.25 an hour now, $10.10, .10, that sounds like a lot of money. My friends, if the minimum wage had just kept pace with inflation since 1968, the minimum wage today would be $10.56 an hour. That's how far we've fallen behind in this country. Corporations and the, well, and the wealthy, they're awash in wealth, but none of that's trickling down. So much of this wealth has been built up by hardworking Americans and has been accumulated in fewer and fewer hands. And then, then we have a tax code skewed towards the wealthy, riddled with loopholes. Our tax code gives companies tax breaks for moving jobs to other countries. The tax code allows wealthy hedge fund managers to pay a lower tax rate than teachers, nurses, and yes, you firefighters. They pay a lower tax rate than you do. Now we have this sequester, a sequester that strikes hardest at programs serving the homeless, the helpless, those with disabilities, and yes, people in the middle class. Well, if we're talking about a sequester, Kevin O'Connor, a sequester that hurts middle class families, that makes it harder and harder for people at the bottom to get into the middle class, why don't we talk about a sequester on the tax breaks for the wealthy and the tax breaks for big corporations in this country? So I, I take issue with those who say we have a, quote, spending problem. Right, sure, can we do things better? Can we cut some things here? So, yeah, of, of course. But the fact is we have a misallocation of our nation's great wealth. We have a saying out in the Midwest, you know, you don't fertilize a tree from the top down. Put it in at the roots. Actually, my friend Jim Hightower had said it best once. He said, you know, manure is a good fertilizer, but it doesn't do much good when it's all piled in one heap. You've got to kind of spread it around a little bit. And that's what we've got to do with the wealth in this country. In the 1990s, when we had full employment, when we had a balanced budget and a growing economy, federal revenues, revenues, taxes, federal revenues that we took in was about 20% of our gross domestic product. Today it's 16 percent, 16 percent. So it's a revenue problem. Now I was here in the early 90s. You remember it, Harold. We had uh, Bill Clinton was president. Dick Gephardt was our speaker. Uh, George Mitchell was our majority leader. And we pushed through an economic package in the early 90s to reduce our deficits to reduce our deficits, to balance the budget. We pushed it through. Not one single Republican voted for it. And I remember debating on the Senate floor with Senator Phil Graham from Texas. Oh my gosh, and, I, and the record is there. 
They can't deny it. Every one of them debate it, saying, oh, this is going to cause a calamity. It's going to destroy the country. Unemployment will go up. Interest rates will skyrocket. See, what we did under that budget bill is we, yes, we rearranged some spending, we cut some down, and we increased revenues. And guess what happened? Employment went up, deficit went down, we balanced the budget by the end of that decade. And then George W. Bush came in as a president. And that was the end of that. So don't blame spending and investment. Don't blame dis domestic discretionary spending, which as a percentage of gross domestic product has been coming down. I'm all for reducing deficits. I voted that way in the past. You know, it seems like if you've got a problem, and that problem is the same problem you had before, and before you got out of it, wouldn't you kind of want to go back and say, what did we do to get out of it? <laughs> we know what to do. We know exactly what to do. We know exactly what to do. But we don't find a partner on the other side willing to work with us. I'm all for reducing deficits to a sustainable level. As I said, I voted for that in a balanced fashion. But we can't lose sight of Hubert Humphrey's test of moral government. I was privileged to know Hubert Humphrey. He used to campaign for me in Iowa. And I think he said it best once. He said, the moral test of government, the moral test of government is how that government treats those who are in the dawn of life, our children, those who are in the twilight of life are elderly, and those in the shadows of life are sick, are needy, and the disabled. My friends, my firefighting friends, we can't lose sight of the fact that our federal government must play a role in making this a more fair and a more just society. So I appreciate your coming to town and visiting Capitol Hill this week to educate your members of Congress on these issues. I deeply appreciate all that you do and your forebears have done. So many who have lost their lives, so many who have been injured for life, saving other people, helping other people to safety. As I said, you've earned our respect. And that respect should be more than just words. It ought to be deeds. We should be doing all that we can to support you, to make sure that you can continue to do the good and valuable work that you do, that your collective bargaining rights are not taken away, that your families and your children can also aspire to be part of the middle class, and that we make sure we protect your pensions. All I can say is I have been proud to be your ally for the last 38 years. I'm proud to be your ally now. As Harold said, even though I may re be retiring from the Senate, I'm not retiring from the fight. I am in it all the way with all of you. Thank you.